Welcome back. Remember last time we were together, we were talking about differential GPS, and we did leave the story incomplete. We weren't quite done. We worried at the end about the impact of ionospheric errors. Specifically, we were worried about accuracy of differential GPS on days when there was an ionospheric storm. What that meant is that the ray from the satellite to the reference was going through a noticeably different ionospheric environment than the ray from the satellite to the rover. And we even showed some data from Ohio where errors of tens of meters could accumulate even when the reference was within, let's say, 60, 70, 80 kilometers of the user. What we'll do today is pick up exactly on that and uh, how GPS and global navigation has responded to that. And it turns out it is with dual frequency or even triple frequency signals from the satellites themselves. If we pop ahead here, we have a, a plot of the frequency spectrum. It looks very busy, but uh, if we spend a moment or two with it, I think you'll get used to it. It starts with very low radio frequencies at the bottom. And by the way, this entire chart is uh, devoted to radio. We don't get into infrared or visible or uh, ultraviolet here. That's uh, well above the chart, off the top of the chart, so to speak. And if you look at it closely, you'll discover that this chart is logarithmic along the horizontal axis. And in the lower left is the beginning of the so-called very low frequency band and it begins at 3 kilohertz. In other words, only 3,000 cycles would go by an observer per second if that observer was standing at a fixed location. And the VLF band goes from 3 kilohertz through 10 kilohertz, shown there in the middle of the chart, up to 30 kilohertz. So it's all uh, really quite low. Remember that the human ear can hear up to 10 kilohertz or 12 kilohertz. So uh, if we converted these radio signals to audio signals, we would be able to hear them uh, reasonably well. Um, if we go up one band, we get to low frequency. And it picks up where VLF ended, off, ended at 30 kilohertz, goes through 100 kilohertz, and up to 300 kilohertz. Now, <clears throat> sprinkled on this chart in white, I do have various examples of specific radio systems. And in the low frequency band, right in the middle, is a system called LORAN that stood for Long Range Navigation. And LORAN, in many respects, is the predecessor to GPS and satellite navigation. It did use transmitters located on the surface of the Earth, but the signaling techniques, this use of pseudo-range, uh, expensive clocks at the transmitter, inexpensive clocks in the user, was all uh, already implemented in LORAN. So GPS had a little bit of benefit from that experience. If we go up one band from LF, we get to medium frequency. So please appreciate the adjectives there on the left, very low, low, medium, high, very high, ultra high, super high. <clears throat> so we're just going up in frequency. Medium frequency is perhaps best known for AM broadcast in the middle. High frequency, very, very popular with radio amateurs who are trying to transmit signals great distances. The white little bands within the high frequency actually belong to a service called WWV, which is a service used to transmit time, transmit information about time uh, nationwide here in the U.S. Above that is very high frequency. Uh, within that is a service called VHF Omnidirectional Range, or VOR. And that is a very traditional, very early radio navigation aid for aviation. Above VHF is ultra-high frequency, UHF. And uh, it goes from 300 megahertz on the left through 1 gigahertz and then up to 3 gigahertz. <clears throat> All of these bands are further divided below these uh, notations that we give here. For example, within UHF, from 1 gigahertz, remember that's 1 billion cycles per second would be going by you if you were watching that wave, 
up to two gigahertz is the so-called L-band. So the L-band extends from one gigahertz to 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1 1.9, and right here we have two gigahertz. Bear in mind, we are plotting things log logarithmically here in the horizontal, so things don't uh, appear linearly. And I call your attention to the L-band because w within L-band is the home of GPS and all the other satellite navigation systems. And they all reside between 1.1, so let's make a mark there, a special mark there, and 1.6. So in this slice is the home of the thing that we've been studying here and uh, we'll study for a few more weeks. Let's take an expanded look at that band. Here it is. Look down once again at the horizontal and we have there I now have it written as 1,000 megahertz, but please appreciate that's the same as 1 gigahertz. Here's the 1.1 that I spoke of. Here's the 1.6 gigahertz that I spoke of. And if you take a look at that, uh, you'll see not only these ARNS and RNSS designators at the bottom, but above that are great clusters labeled GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou, and those are the frequency allocations for those different satellite navigation systems. Um, leading amongst them is GPS L1, which is shown in the lower right. I said lead amongst them because there are probably 3 billion GPS users today, and 99.9% .9 of them only use GPS L1. So of this cluster of frequencies shown here, <clears throat> there's no doubt which one is the senior one and which one has really been carrying satellite navigation for the last few decades. The downside with that is if you only use that one frequency, you don't have any special leverage against the ionospheric errors that we've been talking about. So GPS is expanded and we show here GPS L2 and GPS L5. <clears throat> In a moment, we'll talk about how do you process pseudo range measurements taken at different frequencies to totally remove the effect of the ionosphere. Before we do that, I do want to point out that the Russian system, GLONASS, also has a G1, G2, G5. And so they, too, are going to this triple frequency system. The European system, Galileo E1, Galileo E5, they didn't use an E2, but rather went to a greater uh, frequency spacing over here, Galileo E6. <coughs> um, it's beyond the scope of this short course, but it turns out that the use of E6 rather than, let's say, E2 or GPS L2, does give better performance when coping with ionospheric errors. So please note that not only does GPS use this triple frequency strategy, the Russians do with GLONASS, the Europeans do with Galileo, and the Chinese do with Beidou. Now, all these new triple frequency sat satellites are just now being deployed. So if you were to look at how many triple frequency systems or triple frequency satellites were available through each one, it would differ from uh, constellation to constellation. So let's now turn our attention to why does it make a difference? What's so great about that in terms of the ionosphere? Before I go there, I'm just going to quickly mention that the other advantage of triple frequency signaling is if you have radio frequency interference in one of those bands, then the other two bands are redundant. 
So there's a there's a, a very kind of immediate and pragmatic aspect of this too, which is that you get to have backup signals in case one of those frequency bands gets some uh, interference in it. Now, here's the story for the dual frequency ionospheric measurement. We, we can expand this to three frequencies, but I, I think for the time being, for our purposes, we're just going to work with the two. And I would like to immediately draw your attention to these two equations. And they've been simplified, but I hope you recognize them. These are the measured pseudoranges. The one on the left is at frequency L1. The one on the right is at frequency L2. And we show that it includes the normal pseudo range on the right hand side. And when we write rho like that, what we mean is it includes all of the elements of the measured pseudo range that are not a function of frequency. So that's where true range would appear. <clears throat> that's where the user clock offset would appear. That's where the satellite clock offset would appear that's where troposphere would appear. Because tropospheric delay, certainly in the L-band, does not vary as we go from frequency L1 to frequency L2. Most importantly are these two terms. And we could rewrite them, if we liked, as I, L2, and I, L1. So we've seen that capital I before, it is the contribution to the pseudo range measurements due to the ionospheric delay. And what we're emphasizing here, what we're amplifying here, is that IL1 depends on the frequency itself, L1, and that's the 1575.42. And IL2 depends on the carrier frequency uh, at L2, which is the 1227.60. Let me just draw these things in for you. FL2, 1227.60. L1, don't quite know where I'm going to put it, but I'm going to go down here. 1575.42, both times 10 to the sixth, of course. Why is that a good thing? If we have two equations at two different frequencies, and one of the errors on the right-hand side is a known function of frequency, what we're going to do is use those two equations together to solve for the ionospheric total electron content, TEC, shown there in the numerator. And we're simply going to take advantage of the fact that FL1 squared and FL2 squared are different. Since they're different, we can illuminate and solve for TEC. So by using the measurements at the two frequencies, we can actually solve for TEC and therefore capital I, capital IL1, capital IL2, whatever you like. How would we go about this algebraically? Why don't we just define some blend of tau L1, <coughs> the measurement we're making at the L1 frequency, and tau L2. And we'll define it this way, and we'll call it tau ionofree is equal to a little bit of L1. As a matter of fact, we're going to take alpha as the coefficient for L1, and beta times tau L2. What would we like? <coughs> we would like alpha plus beta to be summing to 1. And so we write that as a constraint right here. Why do we want that constraint? Because if that's not true, then tau ionofree will not have rho appearing uh, by itself on the right-hand side. It will end up getting multiplied by something, which is not what we want. We want tau ionofree to be equal to rho plus zero contribution from iono. How do we enforce that zero contribution from IONO aspect? It's with the second constraint, which is shown right here. We ask two things of alpha and beta. First of all, that alpha plus beta is equal to 1. 
for the reason we went over, and that alpha times IL1 plus beta times IL2 sums to zero. If that's true, if we can find that kind of blend of the L1 and L2 pseudo ranges, we'll have exactly what we want. Something where the pseudo range, rho, is preserved, but the iono is extinguished. Well, <clears throat> you can set up these equations. I invite you to do it. You can solve and you'll find alpha is equal to 2.54, beta is equal to negative 1.54. If you use those two values in this equation here, you'll discover that through the use of dual frequency signaling, you can get an iono-free measurement in the rover with no support from the reference receiver. This is something now that can be done with a so-called standalone GPS receiver. Looking forward, <clears throat> this means that the performance of standalone GPS, Galileo, Beidou, GLONASS, will improve dramatically because the, last, the, the largest natural error source, the IONO, can be extinguished. And that if we do use it in differential architectures, that's one bias that we no longer have to worry about. Thanks for your attention. Look forward to seeing you next time.